welcome to Wednesday, or at least Wednesday is the day I'm recording this. I think it actually will be published on Friday. But anyway, I'm back after some time off. I hope everyone enjoyed their holidays and new year. Welcome to 2022. And that's pretty crazy. I turned 30 this year, which is um a whole thing. If you follow me on Twitter, you already know, but I am pregnant with my first child, which is one of the reasons I have been so MIA. I'm tired and mornings can be hard, but it was one of my New Year's resolutions to get back into some kind of upload schedule, so I will do my very best. Okay, so on to actual, you know, video content. If you like the content, please like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. Since a settlement has been reached, including a statement made by the Mail on Sunday on the front page, I thought I would do a comprehensive video on this whole debacle. Now, I have done some videos on aspects of this case in the past. I will try to link them here, but we all know how that goes. At the very least, they will be in the description. Let's start at the beginning beginning. While Harry was visiting Meghan in Toronto, Canada in October of 2016, the news broke that they were dating in the Sunday Express, written by Camilla Tomini. Now, it's always been somewhat of a question on how Tomini got the scoop, especially since Harry and Meghan had been dating privately for five to six months. I will say this, Tomini is considered to be the Middleton mouthpiece, but let's move on. This very first article is actually relatively positive. Meghan is described as stunning and as a U.S. actress, model, and human rights campaigner. Not bad. Another kind of funny thing about this article is it actually takes a hit at a lot of the lies and criticism that would be thrown at Megan later. It makes it clear that Megan was single, living alone with her dogs when she met Harry. It says that she had met Will and Kate already and, quote, fitted in straight away. Tomini even goes as far to call Megan a household name in the U.S. and repeatedly states how popular and successful Suits is slash was. I hate giving her the click, but the article at this point is almost six years old, and you really have to read this thing. It's almost insane how positive it is. You feel like you're kind of in the twilight zone. Of course, this positivity lasted for approximately one hour. See, Megan was different than any other woman Harry had dated, and I'm not talking about just her appearance. She was older, had a laundry list of accomplishments, including being financially independent. As an American, she faced xenophobia from the UK press. As a mixed-race American, she faced worse. It took a week for Harry to have to issue a statement asking for the abuse and harassment to stop, noting the racial undertones from the reporters themselves. The minute their relationship was announced, and to be honest, probably before that, the tabloids had been in overdrive to dig up dirt on Megan, going far as to try and pay co-stars and ex-boyfriends to lie. While they were having fun writing straight out of Compton, they were having trouble digging up anything with actual substance. That was when they found her father. Like the media, Tom Markle was positive at the very beginning. But even by saying positive things to the press, he showed them he was willing to talk to them. A big departure from the Middletons, whose tight lips, at least in public, made Kate Middleton a very enticing prospect to the palace. After the news that Harry and Meghan were engaged in November of 2017, the harassment of Meghan and anyone surrounding her got worse. Despite his protests that the media intrusion was not welcomed, Tom and his favorite flying monkeys, daughter Samantha and son Tom Jr., continue talking to the press at pretty much every given opportunity. It's hard to pin things down because Megan has never gotten into the nitty gritty publicly, but it's pretty clear from photo evidence that Megan has not been, quote, close with the Markle side of that family in a long, long time. Despite, of course, them insisting both that they were close until Harry or that Megan totally abandoned the Markles years ago. Neither the Markles nor the press can decide on that narrative. For those people who have complicated familial relationships, it wasn't exactly rocket science. Megan's parents divorced when she was young. She lived with both of them at different stages of life. She reportedly told friends that her mother was treated like staff by Samantha and Tom. There is no evidence outside of a single stilted photo that Megan and Samantha or Tom Jr. had relationships as adults. Megan, the mixed step-sibling, reaches success career-wise and financially on a popular television show. She then goes on to marry the most eligible bachelor in the world. The Markles, who again have no evidence that they even spoke to Megan outside of asking her for money, were upset that they weren't included in all of this. 
and started doing everything they could to extend their 15 minutes of fame. Throughout 2017 and into 2018, it was clear that Megan had one request to her father's side of the family. Stop talking to the press. It is not helpful. But grifters have to grift, and the UK media was more than happy to have the Markles as a bludgeon to hit Megan with. Of course, Tom, nor either of his children, cared that they were being used against Megan, I would even argue that, especially when it came to Samantha and Tom Jr., they were happy to insult their, quote, too big for her britches step-sibling that they had always looked down on. Right before Harry and Meghan's 2018 wedding, news broke that Tom Markle had accepted money to stage photos with the paparazzi. What I would imagine would come as a body blow to both Harry and Meghan. Meghan, who had bought her father's clothing, airfare, and hotel room for their wedding happening in a few days' time. Over the course of 28 hours, Tom wavered back and forth publicly on whether or not he would attend Megan's wedding. The reason allegedly being that he had, quote, heart surgery, which apparently was a stent placement. Now, as a nurse whose career has mostly been cardiac, I can't say for sure, but this whole heart attack for surgery versus stent placement story has always been suspicious. It doesn't make any sense for it to have been emergent, and it doesn't make any sense for it to have been scheduled either. Personally, I think he's full of shit and needed an excuse to get out of showing up to his daughter's wedding, of course, days before it was going to happen. And of course, all this discourse is done publicly. Tabloids don't pay for private issues. It appeared, at least on the surface, kind of, that Tom regretted missing the wedding and the damage he had done to the relationship between himself and Megan. Although, of course, he told this to the press, saying at the end, I hope my relatives will just shut up about everything. You can read this as sympathetic. My thoughts, however, come down to money. I think he was worried Megan would cut him off, which she eventually did. Of course, all of Tom's relatives did not shut up. Samantha Markle was upset that her family was not awarded a coat of arms, which she, of course, expressed publicly. Tom's supposed vow of silence lasted about a week before he was also back in the news claiming that the stories he had asked for money were false, despite a long history of him asking Megan for money. It's clear that Tom and Megan's relationship changed drastically after her wedding. I would argue for good reason. Tom became increasingly frustrated that Megan was not speaking with him enough and started making increasingly incendiary claims both through interviews and print media. He, of course, took no real responsibility for the pain he had publicly caused his daughter, and again, the press were more than happy to publish his whining, as long as it hurt Megan. I will say again, Megan's biggest and seemingly only request from him was to stop talking to the press. As we now know, thanks to the emails and texts released by Jason Knopf, Harry and Megan were facing increased pressure from the royal family to shut her father up. In the summer of 2018, Tom's public complaints had focused mostly on the family itself rather than just attacking his daughter or staging goofy photos. The institution had had enough, and according to Megan, Harry was getting constant pressure from his family, specifically his father, to make it stop. In order to try and get the royal family to see that she no longer had any power over the Markle family, and I would argue a monster that the royal family helped create through the press, Megan offered to write a letter to her father explaining in detail how hurt she was. The letter itself is is just sad. It also outlined several points. Megan had heard about Tom's supposed heart attack through tabloid media. Tom refused to speak with her or any representative and only spoke with TMZ. Tom had not attempted to reach her since the week of her wedding, despite Megan's contact information not changing. Megan directly tells her father that he has caused pain and that he is exploiting her relationship with her husband, that he has been lying to the press about asking for money. All in all, the letter makes Tom look like an ass. Despite the letter being dated August of 2018, Tom did not leak excerpts from the letter until February of 2019, supposedly in response to a People article where friends of Megan attacked him and his constant leaking to the press. One friend also mentioned the letter. I think he thought the letter would make him out to be a sympathetic figure. Uh, It did not. In total, there were five articles that included excerpts of the letter, most of them having headlines on the front page. There were also many other articles with spinoffs, such as a handwriting analysis, etc. 
Outside of the letter situation, tabloid harassment of Megan had only increased exponentially since the announcement of her first pregnancy with Archie and the success of the Sussexes' Oceana tour. Most of us who have been engaged with this story argue that it was after the success of the tour that the family itself really geared up against Harry and Meghan. So the backdrop to Tom leaking excerpts of the letter is a sad and stressful one. Harry and Meghan are facing attacks from both the media and his own family. Meghan is pregnant with her first child. Tom is spiraling, and the tabloid media is again using him to attack his own daughter. We don't know much about Tom's response, but both parties have agreed that it ended with this, quote, I wish we could get together and take a photo for the whole world to see. If you and Harry don't like it, fake it for one photo and maybe some of the press will shut up. Which, to many, reads like extortion. Tom wanted more evidence that he had a relationship or power over Megan. In October of 2019, it is announced that Harry and Meghan are suing Associated Newspapers, the parent company slash publisher of the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday, for printing the excerpts of the letter, citing misuse of private information, infringement of copyright, and breach of the Data Protection Act of 2018. The statement also went on to say the case hinged on contents of a private letter that were published unlawfully in an intentionally destructive manner. Despite multiple other members of the royal family suing tabloids, some successfully on the basis of privacy, the concept that Meghan was actively taking on a tabloid publisher, especially regarding the gift that keeps on giving, her shitty father, well, was almost too much to bear for some royal reporters. It was a foolish case, destined to lose. More importantly, more embarrassment for the royal family. Again, despite other members doing the exact same thing. This case became central to the press argument that the Sussexes were supposedly sue happy and trying to silence the media who at this point were publishing hundreds of articles on Harry and Meghan a day. Fast forward, we know what happens. Harry and Meghan are forced to announce their departure from being working members of the royal family in January of 2020, again by another press leak. From the same press they were supposedly silencing, but I digress. Harry and Meghan did an interview in Oprah, in Oprah, Okay. With Oprah in 2021, where Megan yet again directly addressed her relationship with her father, again talking about how the media literally hunted him down, gave him incentives, but when she tried to intervene, he lied to her. That, again, he had caused her intentional pain. So, obligatory, I'm not a lawyer. But I'm going to try and do my best. This case might seem odd to Americans since our First Amendment would likely have made this case not possible in the United States. But the UK has no such law. The first round of arguments were this. Megan argued that by publishing excerpts of the letter, the Mail on Sunday had violated her privacy and copyright. The Mail responded with Megan had intended the letter to leak and had written it with the help of her communications office, specifically Jason Knopf, so she had no expectation of privacy. They also argued that Tom Markle was entitled to release it because the letter had been mischaracterized in a People article. This leading argument was the first hint that we got that Jason Knopf was participating in the lawsuit on the side of the mail on Sunday. So who is Jason Knopf? Well, at the time the letter was sent, Knopf was the Kensington Palace communications chief. He was then rewarded for his behavior by being promoted to head Will and Kate's foundation. To give you a little insight onto how this all works, there is zero, and I mean zero chance, that Knopf came forward and helped the mail without William's abject blessing, and possibly even under his direction. So here we have a high-ranking Cambridge staffer working with a tabloid against a member of their own family. Diana weeps. Moving on. Now, it's always been my personal opinion that the Mail on Sunday knew it was going to lose this lawsuit, and the only reason they didn't settle it was because it gave them headlines they could use, again, to bash Megan. In 2020, the global narrative around Harry and Megan was changing, No longer were the UK tabloids the arbiters of information, and their repeated use of Meghan's obviously estranged and delusional father wasn't quite hitting the same notes it had in 2018 and 2019. The media needed something else, and between their move to California and this lawsuit, they had what they needed. As the case moved through the court, Knopf suddenly had cold feet and admitted that he had not, in fact, actually written any part of the letter dealing a blow to the argument that Megan technically shared a copyright. Again, I question why this information took years to come forward. 
In my opinion, Kensington Palace was more than happy to help out the mail on Sunday as long as they were hammering Megan. That is, right up until Knopf would have had to actually lie to a judge. Again, I think one of Diana's sons was helping a tabloid publisher. Megan's lawyers asked for a summary judgment and were granted one, with Judge David Warby ruling that the mail publishing the extracts of the letter was manifestly excessive and hence unlawful. I have actually somewhat unfortunately read the 53-page judgment, but I think this paragraph sums it up pretty well. The quote goes, This case has been put a little differently in argument. Mr. Rushbrook submits that the central issue in the case is this. Does the writer of a letter that is self-evidently private and sensitive have the right to decide whether, when, how, and to what extent to publish its contents? Or does a newspaper have the right to publish those contents without the prior consent or even knowledge of the writer? The overall submission is that the answer is obviously the former, and that a proper analysis compels the following conclusion. At the time of its publication, the claimant, Megan, had a reasonable expectation of privacy in respect of the contents of the letter. And, this being the case, and applying the requisite balancing exercise, the defendant, the male, has failed to discharge the burden which rests upon it to advance a viable justification for interfering with that right. Knopf had already admitted he didn't write any of the letters, so there goes that argument. As for the third, Warby goes on to say that the comments made in the People article regarding the letter and Megan's relationship with her father were obviously made from Megan telling her friends about her struggles. There was never an argument that any of her friends had actually seen or read the letter. It was intended to remain private, and the People article did not give Tom an excuse to provide the letter, nor did it give the Mail on Sunday an out to publish it. I will note for myself here that the articles surrounding the letter excerpts did not even address Tom's central claims. To go on with my personal review of this case, I will add that Harry and Megan have never asked for impunity from the press. They asked that harassment stop. As Warby would state as well, there was no actual public interest for this story to be published. It was meant to hurt Megan, to continue the heavy harassment she was facing by the press. After receiving the summary judgment, Megan would say that much herself, that the continued harassment is a game to news outlets, but for individuals themselves, it is very real sadness. These stories produce real damage to people and their families. Despite the spin immediately placed on the wind for Harry and Megan, even some conservative authors had to admit that this judgment had bolstered their media strategy. Megan had won a statement on the front page of the Mail on Sunday, legal fees of over a million dollars compensated, and an unknown amount of damages. For their part, the Mail on Sunday mourned, probably over the fact that due to the summary judgment, Megan and Tom wouldn't be going back and forth about their relationship on the stand. They, of course, appealed the decision almost immediately. So, the Mail appealed. This time, their arguments were Megan had no expectation of privacy, which now includes new text messages and emails from our favorite Jason Knopf, that by the letter being mentioned to the authors of Finding Freedom, Megan had made private news public, and again, that Tom Markle had the right of reply to the People article. Megan's argument remained exactly the same. Bruising from Megan's win in February, UK tabloid media again reared up the attacks and spin desperately trying to convince their audience that Megan would of course lose on appeal, that she could not win again. Specifically, multiple articles mentioned that continuing this case would, quote, cause Megan Markle pain. Of course that did not happen. The Mail on Sunday lost, for a second time. This time, three judges reviewed the case and came to the same conclusion. The Duchess had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the contents of her letter, those contents were personal, private, and not matters of legitimate public interest. This time, the senior judge also pointed out that the articles in the Mail on Sunday had been sensationalist, rather than focusing on Tom Markle's response to negative media reports. Despite the spin and the promises that Megan would not best a tabloid publisher again, she did. This time in a statement saying that the ruling was a victory not just for her, but for anyone who has ever felt scared to stand up for what is right. Megan was right. The tabloids were wrong. Of course, instead of congratulating her, the royal family continued to hide behind their press bulldogs, which isn't all that surprising since the third in line was actively helping the tabloid publisher. Still, this is really a victory for the entire royal family, but they will never, ever see it that way. The Mail on Sunday hemmed and hawed and 
threw out the idea of appealing to the UK Supreme Court, a pretty dubious idea, but I digress. The day after Christmas, known as Boxing Day in the UK and I think in Canada, also known as one of the slowest news days of the year, the Mail on Sunday reluctantly printed their statement acknowledging that Megan had bested them. It's over. They will not appeal. Megan has now won her legal costs, now mounting to close to $2 million covered, a nominal pound for the invasion of privacy, and a confidential sum for copyright infringement. In the quest for headlines and to try and stop Megan from winning, Jason Knopf inserted himself again. I will remind you once more that there is zero chance he did this without Williams' either express permission or his express bidding. They thought that this release of texts and emails would somehow prove that Harry and Meghan had known the letter would leak and had actively participated in Knopf speaking to the authors of Finding Freedom. To absolutely no one's shock, they did not. It was through these texts that we learned that Harry and Meghan were under immense pressure to get her father to stop talking about the royal family. That senior level family members had even given them ideas on how to reach out to Tom, such as seeing him in person or sending him electronic communications, but Megan decided against those forms of communication, fearing that a meeting would be leaked. In the text, Megan acknowledged that there was a risk of the letter leaking, but then went on to describe all the ways they had tried to keep it private, including a direct delivery. I think the most damaging for the deranged was the texts and emails about Harry and Meghan supposedly cooperating with the Finding Freedom authors. They knew it was being published, as how could they not? But neither wanted to speak with the authors. Meghan even raised a concern about one of them, Omid Scobie, after she had seen him tweet something that she called factually inaccurate. They had even asked that they be allowed to send a preemptive message to their friends asking them not to participate with the authors. When Knopf made it clear he was going to participate, he asked for some updates. Megan responded in her statement that nothing she shared with Knopf was special nor exclusive for these authors. Again, this is Knopf trying to throw her under the bus. I would also like to talk about the tone of the communication. The palace had alleged that Meghan Markle bullied staff to the point of tears and frustration quitting. I would ask that you go read the texts. Harry and Megan are asking permission to talk with their friends. Megan's tone is one of appeasement and exhaustion, suspicion that people are working against her. This correspondence shows exactly who was in power and exactly who wasn't. The last thing I want to say here is that through this situation, we learn that Megan does not have access to all of her communications, that the palace, citing security, installed wipes on all of her devices. This leaves us to wonder if they do that to all royals or just the mixed race one. The male has conceded. In the smallest possible print, but still, they have lost. Megan has won. The Rota were sad for about a day, but have moved on to their next attack of Megan. Anything to distract from Andrew, right? In the end, this case bolstered Harry and Megan. Tabloid press should be held to account when they publish private information with absolutely no real public interest. It's hateful, and it's hurtful. The Mail on Sunday lost a whole bunch of money, The royal family showed its ass through William Staffer working with a tabloid publisher and managed to undercut their own bullying allegations. William, I'm sure, remains incandescent. Although there were strides made after Diana's death to rein in paparazzi, we still see how press intrusion has affected so many public figures, often leading to real damage. The more people who can stand up to large publishers, the better. Again, instead of working with the press, the royal family should have been cheering Megan on. Her privacy win is a win for all, especially them. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, and I look forward to seeing you all again soon, hopefully with mom.